a busy port city divided into an old town and a plethora of foreign concessions. A range of wily, endearing and sometimes outright devious characters all hustling and bustling, trying to get by in a globalised, colonised city where Asian and European cultures are colliding and sometimes even hybridising right down at the level of the streets. It's Shanghai, isn't it? Actually, no, it's Tianjin. You could say that the main character of our book for this episode is Tianjin itself. It's a city I've never been to, so both reading and researching Feng Jitai's Faces in the Crowd taught me a lot. Anyway, as you likely know by now, I'm Angus Stewart, and you're listening to the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast. Before we rush into Feng Jitai's Tianjin, let's have the Trichophic News. Now this first story is actually old news, uh, I found out about it on the Paper Republic website, but I'm going to read from a uh, People's Daily kind of light article here. It's called, First Du Fu Poetry Themed KFC Opens in Chengdu. I like this one because it implies that it's first, there might be more following this. If you've never been to China, I should let you know now, KFC is probably the most, well, no, not probably, it is. It's the most popular, or at least most successful, Western fast food chain in the PRC. And Du Fu, if you don't know Du Fu, he's maybe considered one of the greatest poets of ancient China. And his, I think it's his old house, is a, yeah, the Du Fu Thatch, Thatch Cottage Museum is a kind of pilgrimage point and a tourist attraction. Uh, this particular KFC establishment is located in Tianfu Square, which People's Daily calls the economic, cultural and commercial centre of Chengdu. There you go. The next news article, this is a bit less silly and more exciting. It's an update from Makoho's Press about the latest instalment in the translation of Jin Yong's Condor Heroes series, the third in the series I believe. A Snake Lies Waiting is due for release very soon. It's coming out 23rd of January. I'm recording this on the 19th. I'm hoping to have it uploaded today or tomorrow, i.e. before this release date, but that's coming very soon. The next thing I want to cover in the news is another late 2019 list from Paper Republic. It's a list of publications in Chinese, or recommendations of the most interesting or exciting things published in China. Now these include things written in Chinese and published in China, things that are written by Sinophone writers, so written in Chinese outside of China and then published inside, and also works in translation, so things written in other languages and then translated into Chinese. And there's sets of recommendations of such books by a range of different authors, translators, critics, and a lot of them, and this is why I'm going out of my way to mention this, are former guests on the show or former authors we've covered or just names who've cropped up a lot, or even fans of the show. So, of the people who feature as contributors in this article, here's the ones who've got some kind of connection to this podcast. There's Ai who wrote A Perfect Crime. There's Chen Chiu Fan, who, who I had on discussing his own waist height. There's Chen Si An, the playwright and writer who wrote Ocean Hot Pot. There's Dylan Levi King, who's been on one episode and also one Patreon bonus episode. There's Feng Tang, who Michelle Dieter translated. Uh, she did his Beijing Beijing. Michelle was on the show talking about The Untouched Crime by Chen Zijin. Uh, Jeremy Tiang is also in this list. He's not been on the show, but uh, he translated Chen Zian's Ocean Hot Pot and he's come, his name has cropped up on lots of occasions. Then we've got a show listener and translator of Chinese into Swedish, Anna Gustafsson Chen. Hello, Anna, if you're listening. Liang Hong, who I mentioned in the London Book Fair podcast, because I went along to see her being interviewed by Nikki Harmon in the Guanghua Bookstore, uh, Bookshop, sorry, uh, after one of the days, I think the last day of the London Book Fair. Yeah, and there's not just all the recommendations from all these people, there are lots of other cool and knowledgeable people recommending cool books in this list. I will put a link to it in the show notes, check it out. Now the last news item relates to our author for this episode, Feng Ji Tsai. Um, he has a book which came out in Chinese in 2018 I believe, called Dan Tong Wan Yuan Jing. Sorry if I ruined the tones there. Dan Tong Wan Yuan Jing. And it means something like uh, 
monoculars, like a one-eyed uh, binocular or spyglass. Now, I believe this one will be coming out in translation in 2021. That is what I suspect. And I suspect the publisher will be Sinoist Books, the fiction imprint of Elaine Charles Asia, who also published our book for today's episode, uh, Faces in the Crowd, both these books by Feng Jitai. So on this topic, let's charge on and start talking about Faces in the Crowd. I'd like to start by talking a little bit about this book's Chinese name. It's Su Shi Qi Ren. Four characters, Su Shi Qi Ren. Sorry if I've bungled the tones, I usually do. So it took me a little bit of investigation to work out the meaning of this Chinese title, but I did get there eventually. Su Shi is a concept from Chinese Buddhism, so I've learned, it means the secular world, or probably more accurately, the vulgar world. And this is, if you know a little bit about Buddhism, this will make sense. This, the vulgar world is the thing that Buddhists wish to free themselves from, from the kind of vulgar earthly concerns. So that explains Susha, the first of the, the first two of the four characters. The last uh, two, number three, number four, Qi Ren, they're easier for me because I knew Qi from Qi Guai, meaning like weird or strange. And Ren, that's an easy one. That's the character for a person. It looks like a little finger man or stick man, or stick man's legs. And that means people, or person. So the next step, obviously, is to put these four together. And my dictionary app helped me here. I've got a Chinese to English, English to Chinese dictionary app. And if you put in Susha Qi Ren, it actually has an entry. And what it says is that it's a novel by Feng Jitai called Extraordinary People in Our Ordinary World. So contrast that with Faces in the Crowd quite different. It's a more literal translation from my inexperienced perspective. There's a strength and a weakness to this title, Extraordinary People in Our Ordinary World. So the strength is that it's taken Susha and Chiren, and it's kind of got the words extraordinary and ordinary from them. So it's linked them through this root word, ordinary, and it's captured the original meaning. But I think the problem with it is it's just really long, it's long and it doesn't, it just doesn't really sound like a nice natural title in English, even if it is a kind of symmetrical, it's, it's an intellectually satisfying translation because it's brought in some symmetry. Um, but I just don't think it's a great book title, especially considering these books, to be read, they have to sell, so they have to be marketable. So Faces in the Crowd, I think that's a good loose translation because it sounds like a book title, maybe first and foremost, but it also it captures the individuality of like the, the person through their face. So the strange people or unusual people, extraordinary people, they're the faces and the crowd, the mundane crowd, that is the vulgar world, the susha. And it also, the faces in the crowd, it gives you a feeling of hustle and bustle, which this book, Feng Jitai's book, is totally full of. Another little fun wee nugget is if you go on uh, Chinese web pages for uh, Susha Chiren, Faces in the Crowd, and also translate them. If you're using Chrome, it's a, I think it's a built-in function these days. It turns Susha Chiren into the secular man, <laughs> which I suppose it's a very auto-translate translation, and that sounds, the secular man does sound like it might be a book title, maybe an academic book, but it's, um, it's obviously not anywhere close to what we should be getting. Yeah, I, I think that's enough waffle for me, someone who can actually speak proper Chinese about this book title, but yeah. Uh, what is the book about? Well, the concept is pretty simple. Each chapter begins with an illustration of one of late Qing or Republican era Tianjin's quirkier inhabitants, one of the uh, Qiren, one of the faces in the crowd. And then the chapter tells a brief, usually a pretty brief tale, of how that person became something of a local legend in the Tianjin of their era. The thing that late Qing and Republican Tianjin have in common is that they're both colonized, they're both divided up into foreign concessions and the old Chinese city center. Now according to Bai Ke, which is kind of like the China's Wikipedia, it kind of, Bai Ke is to Wikipedia what Baidu is to Google, if that makes sense. So according to the entry for Su Shi Qi Ren on Bai Ke, Feng Jitai collected these characters and these stories, all the faces, from local legends that have been long circulating in Tianjin, and one of them, which relates to a certain snack called baozi, or a particular kind of baozi, is of, I suppose it's a name or a word I'd heard of, but we'll talk about more about that later. 
in the episode. So um, there is a little bit more historical backgrounding I can give you. Um, it's going to involve me reading an excerpt from the translator's note in the end matter of the book. The translator is Olivia Milburn. We'll hear a little bit more about her later on. But for now, I'm just going to read that excerpt, which sets the historical scene quite nicely. Okay, so here we go. In Faces in the Crowd, 36 Extraordinary Tales of Tianjin, Feng Jitai takes an unsentimental look at the inhabitants of this city or in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a time when this great port city was in fact composed of two entirely different communities, the inhabitants of the old walled Chinese city and the nine foreign concessions located to the southeast. During this period, Tianjin people find themselves living at the sharp end of global capitalism and colonial greed, and the city was a battleground between the forces of conservatism and those who enthusiastically embraced this new world. These tales provide a sometimes charmingly picaresque, sometimes chilling and bleak look at the way in which the residents of Tianjin adapted themselves in the struggle to survive. I'll just interject here and say you'll see a lot of how this kind of hustle plays into the chapters, and you'll also see how dealing with the kind of foreign presence or influence, let's say, became part of life for these people. Interjection over, let's continue the quote. The world described in this book no longer exists. This is not just a matter of the amount of time that has passed, but also due to the physical destruction of the old walled city in the process of modernization and the relocation of the original inhabitants to concrete tower blocks far away from the places they used to live and work. Where old skills and old businesses survived, they are only a shadow of their former, former selves. However, as long as Feng Jisai's writings are read and loved, the Tianjin that he has spent trying spent his life trying to save will not have been entirely lost. So I won't explain them here, but a lot of the themes or topics that this little quote from the translators afterward touched on will re-emerge as we talk more about the book. I'll say that much for now. Now I'd like to talk a wee bit about the this translated edition that I'm reading, because it's actually not out yet. The publisher is Elaine Charles Asia's Sinoist Books imprint, that's their fiction imprint. Elaine Charles Asia publishes basically China books, mostly translated from Chinese. And Sinoist Books is a fairly recently launched imprint that is going to cover all I think I think all of their fiction titles. So this book is coming out in print and as an ebook this March, March 2020. Uh, I've read the ebook, not the print book, and what I can say is the format of uh, Fung's writing, it works really well on e-readers, in my case the Kindle. Basically, the format goes illustration, start of the chapter, main body of the chapter, next illustration, and so on. So it's really good, no matter what, uh, what size you've got your text at, it's just a nice little, somewhat light, but engrossing thing to flick through. I suppose the advantage of the print copy would be that you could dip in and out wherever you like, uh, random access to use the computer term, computing term, whereas um, in a Kindle you, 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 can, you can get your random access by using the contents page menu, but it's more suited for going, you know, A, B, C, D from, from the start to the end. But in any case, uh, it's, it's a very readable little book, and it's, uh, <laughs> I guess to use another computing term, it's modular. You could kind of rearrange these chapters in any order. There isn't necess- There's a feeling of the city that I suppose builds, and I, I do think Fung might have placed certain chapters in certain places. There's some heavier ones. Third last and the second last are pretty heavy, and they're followed by quite a light one. But I do think you could shuffle about these chapters, put them in any order, and the book would be. It would. It might vary a bit from one shuffle to the other, but the book would kind of still be the same book. Ninety percent would still be the same book. I would say there's not a grand narrative. It's just lots of little snatches of life. So yeah, the, another thing I can say about this edition is that the cover art, or the, the cover image, is, is pretty cool. Um, it's very different from the original Chinese, which is more of a standard, um, fairly standard literary Chinese book cover. Um, they say I've gone for like a sea of faces, but the one at the front, he's a bit different, just like the kind of quirky characters who dominate this book. He's got a little earring, He's got a little beard, one of these ones that is a moustache, plus uh, the bit that goes around your mouth. I, I don't know what the technical name is for that face, kind of facial hair. I most associate it with um, North American men of a certain age, usually the ones who are overweight, if you can picture that kind of facial hair. And then we've got a pair of 
what I only know as Morpheus glasses, Morpheus in the Matrix, the little, um, the, uh, the dark ones that are very small, have your eyes and have no clips that go over your ears. So he's, he's a pretty cool looking dude, the character on the front cover fits the, what can I say, the quirky, the quirky feel of the book as a whole. Now the Chinese editions, the original editions of this book, they're an interesting case because there's been two. There was an edition in 2008 which had 18 chapters, obviously with 18 characters, 18 little chiren or faces, but in 2016 there was a new edition which doubled the number of characters to 36 and I didn't know that when I started reading so I wasn't looking to see which one, if there was kind of two feels to the writing, but in retrospect I would say it's not noticeable. I didn't get the feeling that the book was a... Oh, pardon me, sorry. I didn't get the feel that it was a book of two halves in any way. It's perfectly seamless. And you'll be... well, you'll have guessed from my analysis just there, the ACA Sinoist Books Edition has all 36 chapters. It's not the 18, it's nothing trimmed out, it's all 36 of the Chiren, the faces in the crowd. Now let's talk a little bit about the translator and the author. So as I mentioned before, our translator is Olivia Milburn, and outside of this episode, that is a name we've heard before on the show. If, if you're thinking, hmm, that rings a bell, but where from? And you're looking through the uh, titles of the episodes and not seeing her name, that's because uh, she was a one of the two translators of Empires of Dust. We had the other co-translator, Christopher Payne, on as a guest for that one. This was on episode 14. But Olivia Milburn was a co-translator of that book, along with Christopher Payne. Um, you could also remember, if you've got a very good memory, that the publisher of Empires of Dust was also Sinoist Books. So yeah, that's why you're getting the little strange tingling in your brain thinking, hmm, where did I hear that name before? Now, who is Olivia Milburn? I still haven't answered that question. Well, although this seems a bit cheap, I'm literally just going to read her Wikipedia entry, because I think it's great, and I think it is a particularly good read to give you a feel for why Olivia was drawn to, well, why she's drawn to the things she is drawn to, if that makes sense. Right, so I'm going to skip certain sections, but this is basically what you need to know about, or what the basics for who is our translator. Olivia Milburn is a sinologist, author, and literary translator who specializes in Chinese cultural history and in Chinese minority groups. So I'll interject here. We definitely have cultural history in Faces in the Crowd. Minority groups, not so much, but definitely cultural history. And the kind of, it, it relates to, as, as we'll mention a bit more when we get to Feng Jitai, there is an idea of protecting marginalized communities or marginalized uh, his, uh, what's the word cultural cultural legacy heritage that's the word protecting marginalized cultural heritage that's relevant i guess to both olivia and feng Jisai. so milburn grew up in a multilingual family living in eight different countries and became interested in chinese literature as a teenager after reading a translation of dream of the red chamber she completed a bachelor's degree at St Hilda's College, University of Oxford in 1998, and I'm going to skip through all these qualifications. Da, 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 da. Contributions. Milburn has authored several books, including Cherishing Antiquity, Antiquity, The Cultural Construction of an Ancient Chinese Kingdom. So again, Cherishing Antiquity, Protecting Cultural Heritage. There's a aligned interest there with uh, Feng Jisai. Urbanization in Early and Medieval China, Gazetteers for the City of Suzhou. Urbanization that matches the concerns, the urban concerns of Faces in the Crowd, and the Spring and Autumn Annals of Master Yan. She's also a Chinese to English literary translator. Her translations include the best selling novel Decoded by Mai Jia, co translated with Christopher Payne, just like Empires of Dust was which caught her attention because of, fam because of a family connection. Her grandfather was a codebreaker in World War II, like the book's protagonist. Her translation has been praised for its tightly wrought aphorisms and for the classical beauty and elegant taste of the language. And there are little citations there if you want to know who gave these commendations. In 2018, Milburn's translation work was recognised by the Chinese government with a special book award of China which honours contributions to bridging cultures and fostering understanding. 
So another parallel here with Feng Jitai, as as we'll hear, Feng Mr. Feng is he's received many awards and prestigious positions and so on from Chinese institutions and the government. So they're both recognized for their good work, I guess. Then there's a list of selected works and translations. I think we can skip those. So that's Olivia Milburn. Now, who is Feng Jitai? Well, I would say first and foremost, he's a very interesting and very accomplished person. He was born in 1942, which makes him 78 this year. As well as a writer and an artist, he's a cultural scholar and has campaigned to protect to protect local traditional culture in China from erosion. Now I'm going to read a couple of other web pages here because they say what I want to say better than I can say it. The first is going to be a list of his positions that are listed on the website chinavite.com. Then I'm going to read his bio from the Paper Republic website because it focuses on him as a man of literature, let's say, that focuses on his writing career rather than his other cultural work, which I guess is kind of going to be more summarized by his positions listed in China Vitae. So let's stop waffling and let's read those. Right, so here's what China Vitae says about Feng Jisai. Feng Jisai, male, Han nationality, is a native of Tianjin. He was born in 1942 and joined the China Association for Promoting Democracy in 1983. Feng began his career painting, sorry, Feng began his career painting at the Tianjin Calligraphic and Painting Studio. In the 1970s, he taught at a Tianjin School for Arts and Handcraft Workers. After 1986, he became more prominently involved with writers' associations. That year, Feng was the vice chairman for the Tianjin Federation of Literary and Arts Circles. He also worked with the Tianjin branches of the Chinese Society for Study of Folk Literature and Art, as well as the Chinese Writers Association. In 1988, he became executive vice chairman of the 5th China Federation of Literary and Art Circles. He later served as the vice chairman of the 8th and 9th China Association for Promoting Democracy Central Committees. He was elected vice chairman of the 10th China Association for Promoting Democracy Central Committee in 1997. And we have other um, positions he's held. They don't these are just the recent career data, not the complete ones. But th- So these start from 1986, and they're already pretty extensive. So vice chairman for the Writers- Chinese Writers' Association of Tianjin, uh, vice chairman of the Chinese Society for Study of Folk Literature and Art in Tianjin, editor-in-chief of Free Forum on Literature, council member of the China Writers- Chinese Writers' Association from 1988, executive vice chairman of the... China Federation of Literary and Art Circles, uh, also, um, so I guess the the central committee that we were talking about, that was the CPPCC. Now, if I am recalling correctly, this is what's often known as the kind of quasi-democratic rubber stamp, um, or one of the rubber stamping uh, groups that go up to Beijing to approve things that the government uh, is, I guess, are on the government's agenda, uh, but it's a particularly interesting one because it tries to draw representatives from all across Chinese society, different ethnicities, different regions, different professions. So I, I guess what exactly the power someone has in the CPPCC is up for question, but it's certainly a, a prestigious thing and it, to be a member of, and it's a recognition of your achievements. If I've got this drastically wrong, by the way, do contact me um, by social media or whatever means and give your feedback and we can relay it to the listeners of the show. But yeah, um, continuing on through his list of achievements, 1997, we've got, he was the vice chairman of the 8th China Association for, oh, is, is it the same thing? <laughs> I guess, I guess it's a higher position than just member of the CPPCC. Yeah. From 1998, another position, member of, the, I guess, so he went back from being vice chairman to a member. And then from 2001, Dean of the Tianjin University Feng Jisai Literature and Art Institute. And we will talk more about that later on in the episode because that is the Feng Jisai Institute is particularly interesting. It is something that you can look up on your map app, especially if you've got a Chinese map app. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a sec. Now let's read his Paper Republic entry. Now, I don't think it says on the Paper Republic page who wrote this little bio for Feng Jitai, but I'm guessing it was probably either er- Eric Abrahamson or Nikki Harmon's, the site's kind of two main 
contributors, but it's it seems to be very written from a very knowledgeable um, point of view. So anyway, I'll stop praising it and I'll start reading it. Feng Jitai was an important figure in the reactive scar literature and retrospective literature movements that followed directly that directly followed the Cultural Revolution. Not only did he publish short stories and novellas that defined and now represent those genres, if in fact they be separate, he continued to criticise the extremes of the Cultural Revolution in essays, interviews, as well as through the novel Ten Years of Madness, an oral history of the Cultural Revolution, which has been translated into English twice. Later in the 90s, his literary focus moved towards the cultural history of his nar- of, of his native Tianjin, and his stories began to incorporate the mythical, like the novella, the Three Inch Golden Lotus, published by in English by the University of Hawaii in 1996. Of interest to academics are his letters to the critic Li Tuo, in which the two discuss the development of Chinese literature in the 80s and 90s. Feng Jitai's early stories, those which focused on the Cultural Revolution, might be described as scar literature with an artistic consciousness, though just as sentimental as the early work of Liu Xinwu and Lu Xinhua, they display a he- they display a higher level of artistic invention and greater appreciation for subtlety. So a really great entry there. Focus more on his early role in Scar literature, which has come up, I think, in the Empires of Dust episode. Um, didn't focus so much on his Tianjin work, but no problem, because that's what this episode is going to do. I should note, if anyone from Paper Republic is listening, the list of Feng Jitai's works is a little bit empty. But the strange thing is, there's a, only one thing is listed, it's a flash fiction called Granny Drunkard, which we'll be hearing more about this granny in this episode, because she's actually part of Susha Chiren, Phases in the Crowd. But the weird thing is about the entry, title, the author, and the translated are all listed as Granny Drunkard. <laughs> which is a bit strange. Something's gone wrong there. Now, let's talk about the Feng Jitai uh, Institute, or its full name, the Feng Jitai Research Institute of Literature and Art. Now, what I want to bring up about this is my own research, quote-unquote, and I found the the best way to get information was actually using map apps, uh, more specifically Google Maps and the Chinese map app that I have. Its English name is AMAP, its Chinese name is Gaoda D2. The English name isn't really good for much because whether you download this app from a Chinese or an international app store, the, the app actually only works in Chinese. So calling it a map doesn't do much for someone who can't read Chinese. So I'm just going to refer to it as Gauda D2 or Gauda. So if you're on Gauda or indeed uh, Google Maps, if you enter the Chinese name or the pinyin on Google Maps as well, you'll find the physical location of the Feng Jitai, Feng Jitai Institute. So it is, and pardon me for my terrible tones here, the Tianjin Dashue Feng Jitai Wen Shue Yi Shu Yan Jiu Yuan. Um, if my tones were so off you need a literal translation, it is the Tianjin University Feng Jitai Literature Art Studies Institute, or whatever the direct best direct translation of Yuan here is. So yeah, once you're on it on Google Maps, you can see 360 images of like the kind of main outside entryway bit which is i won't i won't try and describe it but it's really beautiful say that much on gauda you get much more images just normal 2d ones of the outside and one of them has a list of it's like a picture of the sign that lists all the kind of sub institutes and departments in this institute and that's really interesting so i'm just going to bring up that image now and read off it because it it's bilingual it has english and chinese on it Right, so just from top to bottom on this sign, the departments, or whatever they are called within the Feng Jitai Institute, are the China's Traditional Village Protection and Development Research Centre, the Feng Jitai Folk Culture Foundation, the China Folk Art Heritage Protection and Research Centre, the China Folk Woodblock New Year Prince Research Base, the Tianjin Dashu Art Gallery, and the Jumping Over the Dragon Gate Folk Art Museum. I don't know how many of these are open to the public, I'm guessing the last two are. So if you're anywhere near Tianjin, the Feng Jitai Jitai Institute is within the Tianjin University campus, and even the outside would be a nice place to visit, it's very pretty. So yeah, there's my tip to you. If you stay in or near or are visiting Tianjin and you want to do a literary pilgrimage to the Feng Jitai Institute, you can at least go up to the door and hopefully get into those two galleries. Now we've got a very special feature on the show, uh, the marketing guy from uh, from 
Sinoist Books has provided me with two little audio readings of two of the chapters from Faces in the Crowd. So what I'm going to do is play each one, and then I'll give you my own kind of commentary on that chapter, and you guys can enjoy and see what you think. And if you want, if you want to give feedback um, or your thoughts on those, then please do, <laughs> because it's, uh, it'll be handy for not just me, but also be interesting for uh, Sinoist Books as well. So here's the first one. This is from the chapter called Boozing Granny, which is about a character called, guess what? Boozing Granny. Three. Boozing Granny. Bars come in all shapes and sizes, but the little tavern on Shoshan Street was one of the very lowest kind. There was no sign hung up on the street. In fact, it didn't even seem to have a name. There weren't any seats inside, and no snacks were sold at the bar. All they had there was one jar of wine. The people who went there to drink were all at the bottom of the ladder. Day labourers, rickshaw pullers, and coolies. Some of them might have a lump of savoury sausage clutched in one hand, or they might have a few five-spice peanuts in a pocket. Coming through the door, they would order up an ounce or two of alcohol, which they would drink all by themselves propped up against the corner of the wall, or leaning against the windowsill. If it happened that a bunch of people turned up at the same time, they would take their bowls of wine outside and stand leaning against the tree. They would sip their wine and savour each drop, and that was just fine. This particular bar only sold one kind of wine, made from sweet potatoes, cheap and strong. The cats people kept as pets up and down Shou Shan Road never got lost, because if they happened to run away, they could always find their way back by following the smell of the alcohol. This wine wasn't prized for its flavour, but for its kick. Sipping it was like sipping acid. You had to swallow down quick before it ruined your tongue and your lips, or wrecked your teeth in your throat, or even got at your eyes. But once you got it down, it would leap into action, going straight to your head, making you woozy and confused. It really did have a kick like a mule. It was just like one of the firecrackers people set off on New Year's Eve. It exploded as soon as you set light to it, filling the sky with flashes of red. That is why this kind of wine is called firecracker. Now, good wine ought to be rich and warming, something to be savoured slowly. It certainly shouldn't go straight to your head. But the poor are struggling to survive from one day to the next, when they are bone-tired or depressed. Why shouldn't they relax and cheer themselves up with a cheap bit of booze with some go to it that would make them feel all light-headed and silly? One of the people who really let themselves go like this was Boozing Granny. Every afternoon, this one old woman would turn up at the tavern as regular as clockwork her clothes in rags like a beggar, her hair a complete spurs nest, and her face as black as soot. There was no one who knew what she really looked like and no one who knew what she was really called. They just knew that she was always to be found drinking in this one bar, and so she was given the nickname Boozing Granny. When she came through the door, she always stopped by pulling out a small square bundle wrapped in a cotton handkerchief. When she opened that, there was a parcel wrapped in newspaper inside and sometimes the newspaper was brand new, while other times it was old. Then, when she opened the paper parcel, there was yet another parcel this time, this time done up in nice wrapping paper, as if there were a piece of jade jewellery inside or something. And when she opened the parcel done up in wrapping paper, there was a couple of coppers inside. She would plonk the money down in the bar, and the barkeeper would pour her usual three quarters of a bowl of firecracker. She would then grab the bowl and craning her neck, raise it to her lips, tipping the contents down her throat in a single flip, just like any other alcoholic. But once Granny got her two feet out of the door, she seems to be trying to move them in every direction at once. She would wobble off down the road, weaving from side to side, and then, when she'd gone about a hundred steps, she hit a crossroads where there was traffic pounding back and forth, a place where accidents often happened. However, you wouldn't need to worry about Granny, she might seem completely sodden with drink, but every time she got to that crossroad, she suddenly come to her senses with a start. Then she seemed like just like anyone else. You wouldn't have guessed that she had a drop to drink, and she'd cross the road safe and sound. This happened day after day, and nothing ever went wrong. The people up and down Shoshan Road loved to watch Boozing Granny's wandering steps as she moved about in an alcoholic stupor, wobbling and wavering, first twirling this way, and then twisting that like a lotus leaf tossed in the wind. And then, when it was raining and she was soaked through, she looked like an umbrella slowly swirling down the road. 
But how could it be that Boozing Granny always sobered up the moment she got to the crossroads? Was it that Firecracker only had a very limited effect? Or did Boozing Granny have some superhuman ability to come round from it in a thrice? The secret to any good wine is in its keeping. The barkeeper was a right bastard, and he watered down his wine. Alcoholics might see the rest of the world through a glass, darkly, but when it comes to what they were tipping down their throats, they know exactly which end is up, and in this case, no one wanted to complain openly. He let them drink there, and that was enough. If the barkeeper was an asshole, then he would have to pay for it in other ways. Here, he was nearly at 60 without chick or child, so the chances were that he'd be the last of his family. But then one day, the barkeeper's wife started having strange cravings for hot and sour foods, and it turns out that she was pregnant. When the barkeeper went to offer prayers of thanks to the Buddha, he found himself making all kinds of resolutions, swearing that from now on he was going to turn over a new leaf, that he'd sell wine just as it was ordered, and he'd never water it down or swap it for irzats ever again. And it was on this very day that Boozing Granny went to her usual watering hole and went through the usual rigmarole of fishing out her bundle and opening up the parcel one layer at a time, then buying her wine, craning her neck as she raised the bowl to her lips. But this time, she was tipping real firecracker down her throat instead of the usual rubbish, and the real thing had plenty of quality to it. On this occasion, Boozing Granny was reading before she even got up the bar. Today, she gave a very fine show of wobbling and weaving as she walked down the road. Her arms would be heading off to the left, while her legs would be going right. And the more she whirled about, the faster she went. To begin with, she was moving like a bird caught in an updraft, but by the end, she was wheeling about like a black whirlwind. The people on Shoshan Road were watching in alarm and puzzlement, but they didn't have much time to think about it. Boozing Granny was already at the crossroads, and she hadn't sobered up at all. She just went charging into traffic on the highway without a second thought, and you can imagine what happened next. After that, Boozing Granny was never seen on the street again. However, it would happen from time to time that the other regulars in the little bar would mention her. They agreed that she was a real drinker. She would just swallow her wine without a single thought about snacks, and she would knock it back in a single gulp. She couldn't care less about anything else. She just wanted to feel the fire of the alcohol. She also wasn't interested in interfering with other people in the tavern and she never gossiped. She would pay her money and drink her wine, and having drunk it, she would leave. She never, ever ran a tab. A real drinker enjoys the drinking and doesn't disturb anyone else in the process. When the barkeeper heard that, he suddenly remembered that the day Boozing Granny had her accident was the day that he didn't cut the wine in her bowl. It was all his own fault. It was very confusing for him. Sometimes, It is not at all clear what the right thing to do is. Was he wrong to have cheated his customers? Was he wrong to have started giving them the real thing? Could it be that for decades he'd been selling cheap and nasty ersatz wine without any problem and everyone had been drinking it up happily? But the moment he gave them the proper stuff, they got themselves into such terrible trouble. When the barkeeper went to offer prayers of thanks to Buddha, he found himself making all kinds of resolutions swearing that from now on he was going to turn over a new leaf, that he'd sell wine just as it was ordered, and he'd never water it or swap it for his outs again. So I really enjoyed uh, Boozing Granny, this chapter, and it was actually me who suggested that this one be on the show. It's got the humour, the darkness, the poverty, I guess deprivation, and the borderline criminal hustling uh, and the tragedy that is all kind of spread across across faces in the crowd. So the character Boozing Granny, it, it's it, to me at least, it's kind of inherently funny. But of course, it, it it's a story of alcoholism, which is not a good thing. I think we can agree alcoholism is not a good thing. We have the barman himself hustling, watering down the drinks, but then ironically finding that maybe that was a good thing for for Boozing Granny watering down her drinks. There's the the darkness of her uh, death. I don't. I think she's not the only character in um, Faces in the Crowd who gets uh, run over and you know killed by being run over. Um, I guess increased traffic would have been a thing in in this historical period. 
Um, another, the only, well, the second thing I have to say about the story um, that makes it, helps it stand out is that I believe there are only three of the 36 chapters are on uh, women. There's another chapter on a couple of um, Boxer Rebellion leaders, leaders of the Red Lanterns, um, who are female. And I believe there's a, a, a chapter on a female character who has some problems with uh, fashionable haircuts. She changes up her style and it causes her some problems. Everything else is men. So that is, whether or not you think that is inherently a bad thing is your subjective position, um, but it is a thing to be aware of going into the book. The, although we've chosen Booze and Granny here, she, is, she represents, as a woman, she is one twelfth of the chapters. She's three out of 36. Just checking my maths. Yes, that's correct, one twelfth. Our second chapter is... Well, I've got it marked as Cloud Belvedere. Let me check what the actual chapter name is. Oh yeah, it's my what my first guess would have been. It's The Master of Cloud Belvedere. So without further ado, let's hear about The Master of Cloud Belvedere. Twelve. The Master of Cloud Belvedere. The Master of Cloud Belvedere was the name given to an educated gent living over by the High River. Why do I call him an educated gent? Well, he is the kind of person who would never, ever get a nickname, but when you mention him, pretty much everyone knows who he is. This educated gent had a narrow face and a thin body. His skin was yellow and dry, and his arms were spindly and long. He looked nothing like so much as a rag draped over a bamboo pole to dry. However, you can't judge by appearances. He was a competent painter and a calligrapher, in addition to which he could carve a beautiful seal, and he was also perfectly capable of mounting a scroll. But the professionals all said that he, well, somehow or another, his works were just too heavy-handed. It was for this reason that he couldn't find a single business in the hall of Tianjin that he'd written a signboard for. Nor was there a restaurant or a medicine shop that had one of his paintings on the wall. When it came to calligraphy and painting, he was a professional, but he was treated like an amateur. When an educated gentleman finds himself in this position, he may well feel that he has no outlet for his talents. Whether he is bitter or sour about this, or bitter and sour about this, only he can tell. The name of his studio, the Cloud Belvedere, was his own invention. He called himself the master of Cloud Belvedere, and wrote a pair of calligraphic couplets which he hung up on the wall facing the entrance. Even though I am in prison among the green hills, said one, my mind wanders among the white clouds, proclaimed the other. He often recites these lines to himself. Every time he intoned them, he would close his eyes and give a little shake of the shoulders, as if he really were some kind of hermit. But in point of fact, Tianjin was a playground for all kinds of people, and the Cloud Belvedere was located right by the eastern entrance to the city's main shopping drag, so there were always hordes of shoppers stampeding past. Besides which, he had the Four Seasons restaurant right next door, and so all day every day he had the most entrancing cooking smells, one after the other coming in through the window. First fish, then meat, then garlic, then soy sauce. And he shut the window? It didn't make the blindest bit of difference. The glass might keep out the smell of frying fish and broiling meat, but it didn't keep out the sights and sounds of the endless partying. One of the neighbours pointed out to him, You might as well open the Cloud Belvedere as a restaurant too. It would make a lovely name for a restaurant, the Cloud Belvedere. It sounds very good. He nearly had a heart attack right then and there. But as time passes, it may happen that your luck changes. There was an interfering type called Chen Ba who came to visit him one day with an American in tow. This man was about 50, bald with prominent eyes and a huge walrus moustache, which meant that you couldn't see his mouth. Chen Ba said this American was interested in Chinese art and antiques, particularly calligraphy and painting. This was the first time that the master of Cloud Belvedere had ever found himself face to face with a westerner, and he was quite overcome, to the point where he didn't know what to do with his hands and feet. When he got up on a stool to hang up his paintings, he nearly went arse over tit. 
The American didn't even notice. He was too busy staring at the paintings on the wall. Each time he came to a new picture, he would just be going wow, wow at the top of his voice, as he had just sprayed some delicate part of his anatomy in boiling water. Afterwards, he would work his chops a bit and sputter a few words of praise. When he was working his chops, you could see something cherry-like, red and shining, pop out from underneath that huge moustache. The master of Carl Belvedere stared at it. It was the old American guy's lips. In the end, he spoke to the master of Carl Belvedere in Chinese, spitting out one word at a time. I am so happy. Thank you. I am so happy. Thank you. These were probably the only words he knew how to say, so he kept repeating them right up to the time that they had to say goodbye and leave. The master of Cloud Balvedere was so delighted he almost went off his head. In his entire life, he never had anyone express so much appreciation for his works before. Two months later, he got a letter in English, which he took to Mr. Zhu, who worked at the Da Gongbao newspaper and could understand foreign languages. Mr. Ju smiled when he read this missive, and said, I don't know what you've done to this American, but he seems to have gone insane. He says since getting back home, he hasn't been able to forget your wonderful calligraphy. He thinks about it all the time and even dreams about it at night. He says he has now come to understand that artists in China are all geniuses. The master of Cloud Belvedere felt as if he were walking on air. His body felt as light as a feather. He couldn't sleep a wink that night, and as soon as it got light, inspiration came to him. He wrote the words, In pursuit of tranquility you will achieve greatness, and mounted it as a scroll with his own hands, after which he headed to the post office. When he posted it off, he included a note to say that he wanted him to hang it up on the wall. Come what may, he should have a photograph taken of himself standing in front of the inscription, and send him a copy. His idea was that he wanted everyone to see it, his friends and family should see it. His neighbors should see it. The people who always shown their contempt for him should see it. The bosses of the big companies should see it. The editors of the newspapers should see it. Hell, he might even take out an ad in the papers and let everyone see it. Open your eyes, people. You don't like what I do, but this American guy does. He waited at the Cloud Belvedere for three months, by which time he was feeling unhappy and discouraged about the whole thing. Finally, a letter arrived with foreign writing on the outside. He quickly ripped it open and took out the letter. It was all in foreign language and he didn't understand a word. There wasn't a photograph. He took up the envelope again. The photograph was inside. He picked up the photograph and looked at it, feeling awkward, as if there was something not quite right. When he looked carefully, he was stunned. The American guy was standing in front of his calligraphy, but it was the wrong way up. He'd hung it upside down. So another quite funny story there. Most of the stories are at least a little bit funny. Some are more outright comic or slapstick than others. Um, I think this point in the story, or in the book rather, does kind of stand out because it's the first point where you really feel the presence of foreigners and I believe it's the first place where a foreign character shows up. And immediately you've got um, this foreigner existing in a business relationship and a cultural relationship with this um, Chinese artist and with the wider, I guess, the wider community or society. I think society is a better word than community, personally. I think the word community is overused, but that's beside the point. <laughs> um, yeah, so the foreign presence is economic, it's cultural, there's cross-cultural appreciation, cross-cultural misunderstanding that goes hand in hand with that appreciation, and maybe some other ideas about what's culturally good, what's culturally bad, or what's culturally wor worth valuable, and what's culturally less valuable. And it ends up being affected by the colonial, or at least the foreign presence, and the buying and selling of goods. And also the language barrier that also gets in the way. Interesting. We, we do see in the whole book, there's a lot of the Tianjin people, the Chinese people who are buying and using and discussing goods from abroad, goods brought in by Westerners. But this story is an example of the opposite, maybe a more rare example, maybe the only example of a Westerner enjoying being fascinated by 
and in this case completely misunderstand or largely misunderstanding the uh, Chinese, specifically Chinese product that he has picked up. Interesting, I think. Also, making fun of Americans. I'm always in favour of that. Now, another wee fun thing that the marketing guy from Sinoa's Books pointed me towards was a little um, WeChat, I think a WeChat article, um, certainly a little article in Chinese about an event that was held uh, for or in honour of Feng Jitai and his book, uh, Faces in the Crowd, bearing in mind the original Chinese title is Su Shi Qi Ren, um, where basically his, his publisher, I believe, they produced some little clay figures, some, is it Nia Ren? I have forgotten. <laughs> Let's just call them little clay figures um, of seven of the characters of the book. And the last one is a particularly, well, a particular favourite of mine. It's a Bowser salesman. And it's not just any old Bowser that this character is selling. It's Gobuli, Gobuli Bowser. Gobuli Bowser. Gobuli I I don't know what the tones are. I don't know why I'm trying to just pull them out of the air, but Gobu Li you, you might have heard of those if you spend time in China or know a little bit about Chinese food. And there's a chapter in Faces in the Crowd which tells the origin story of Gobu Li That's going to be our word of the day. Gobu Li, literally uh, translated, means uh, dog ignores you. Uh, Olivia Milburn drops the dog character. I wonder if it's get rid of the popular foreign connection draw between like dogs and meat possibly she she just translates it as uh, he just ignores you Baozi. and the reason for that is long story short the um the first the Baozi salesman who invented this style was his shop was so popular and so busy he would often not really acknowledge customers he'd just take the money and dish out the Baozi. so people would say he just ignores you or um I think the goal came from a mispronunciation of his surname Gao, according to other legends. But the reason I, I want to go into particular depth in this is I found a couple really interesting um, pieces of writing on Gobu Li Baozi and its origins, which mostly match up with the story in uh, Faces in the Crowd. One's an article, a, a blog, on the um, the kind of lineage of that original Gobu Li Baozi restaurant and the one that exists in Tianjin today. And the other one, I call it a piece of writing, that's a bit of an aggrandizement. It's just the Wikipedia article, but there's interesting stories there. So I'm just going to open up, first of all, the blog, and I'm going to um, summarize its contents. Okay, I'm going to skim read this article for you guys. So, on 5th of November 2011, China published its third national intangible heritage list. In the list is, I think was is better, uh, was the traditional handicraft techniques for making gobuli baozi, uh, a kind of steamed pork bun, applied by the Tianjin, what am I doing? Tianjin Gobuli Group. This is also the first culinary her heritage in Tianjin, a cuisine that is, quote, tasty, convenient, healthy, and nutritious, as described by the Gobuli Group. So I think the existence of the Gobuli Group is interesting, you know, because it started off as one kind of baozi created by one guy, Gao Guiyo, in the Qing Dynasty in 1858, according to this blog. And the origin is something like this. Legends say that the founder Gao was often nicknamed Dog. Remember, that's pronounced Go in Mandarin. And eventually went to Tianjin to apprentice in a steamed bun shop and later opened his own shop. Da 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 da. Over time, people started calling him Go Buli, meaning Dog doesn't pay attention. Open bracket to his customers, close brackets, or if we're being very literal, Dog Ignore. Now here's milestones in the history of Gobuli, according to this blog. In 1988, Gobuli expanded into a high-profile restaurant. In 1992, the Gobuli Group was officially founded. Notice how these kind of fall in the uh, reform and opening period of the 80s and then continuing into the 90s. And uh, in 2005, another traditional enterprise, Tongren, Tongren Tang, bought over Gobuli with 106 million RMB and founded Gobuli Co. Limited. Notice how this is just escalating ridiculously. Uh, in 2011, traditional Gobuli handcraft techniques were listed as China's national, as one of China's national intangible cultural, car <sighs> as one of China's national intangible cultural heritages. What a mouthful that phrase is. I kind of hate it. At least it just accurately describes what it's talking about. In 2015, Gobuli went IPO, and its Singapore franchise opened in February. So we literally have a history of strategic corporate expansion of 
dog ignores you, Baoza steamed pork buns. Uh, it now has a large international enterprise that owns hotels, restaurants, food stalls, and over 70 domestic and international franchised restaurants. Its businesses also include frozen food, frozen food production and retailing, logistics, and cooking schools. And then the uh, blog goes on to talk about um, the Gobuli Group's main restaurant, which I think is in the original location of the first, the first shop. I think maybe it's not. So what have we got here? Uh, Gobuli changed the s- changed its restaurant image a lot. Uh, bright modern dining halls replaced the original antique, traditional Chinese furnishings, citing the need to be internationalized and to appeal to the young. Gobuli also changed its source of ingredients. Now importing, now using imported flour made by Australian and Canadian wheat. And then it decries how the price has escalated. A set of eight balza costs you 45 RMB, and it basically says the whole soul of the thing has been lost. I am not going to skim read the rest, but yeah, what a tale. And it makes a nice sequel to the kind of origin story as told in Faces in the Crowd. Okay, so the Wikipedia article I'm not going to read anything so long from, but there's a very funny little uh, story on there. It's a, a little subheading that just says English translation. In 2008, in anticipation of the 2008 Summer Olympics, which were to be held in Beijing, Gobuli decided to adopt an English name, this being the Gobuli Limited Corporation or whatever. Um, The company decided to to adopt an English name, Gobelieve. So Gobuli had a Yingwen Mingsa, Gobelieve, in hope of better name (laughs) recognition, in hope of better name recognition by foreign guests. However, this was met with heavy criticism by Chinese netizens. Pretty wild. Now, because I was reading uh, this book, Faces in the Crowd, as an ebook on my Kindle, I was able to highlight lots of points. So what I'm going to do now is just go through those highlighted points, and where I think it would be interesting, I'll read you the highlighted point, and then I'll give you my thoughts, i.e. the reasons why I highlighted it. Okay, first one. I'm not actually going to explain the context behind this one. It's the ending of a story, and I'll leave you guys to wonder what on earth is going on with our strange guy, our Chiren, our face in the crowd. He's called Seven Dollar Sue. Sue said, I should explain. You mustn't think that I'm completely heartless, but I cannot change the rules that I have set for myself. Dr. Hua took what he had said away with him and thought about it for three days and three nights, but in the end he decided that he had no idea what on earth Dr. Sue was talking about. However, he always had a great deal of respect for Dr. Sue and how he had behaved on this occasion and the strong principles he believed in. Seven Dollar Sue is a man with a code. Do I have any thoughts here? Not really, but Seven Dollar Sue is one of my favourite characters in this in this book. Okay, this one, this is just the nightmare situation where a talking bird says something completely inappropriate. Again, don't not going to give you the complete context, not going to give you my deep analysis, just going to read it and let you enjoy it. Everyone laughed at that. However, the minor bird had caught the title of Viceroy and now it suddenly flapped its wings, fluffing up the black feathers all over its body. Then it spoke in a loud and crystal clear, furious voice. The Viceroy is an absolute bastard. Everyone in the room froze. Um, What I do remember in this section is everyone in the room is Han Chinese except the Viceroy. He is a Manchu governor. That's something I remember. In a lot of these stories set in the late Qing period, we meet a few of the government people who are Manchu. The highest people in government positions are Manchu, because the Qing was, from start to end, a Manchu dynasty. And Olivia Milburn does the right thing here and renders those names in Manchu, because in, in, in the book, whether or not they're phoneticized or not, they would be written in uh, just normal Chinese characters. But um, Olivia's gone to the effort of rendering them back into something that sounds like Manchu. So props there that is i think in chinese to english translation that's the right thing to do but it takes more work so that's good okay here's a section about a guy if i remember right he's um a bit of a gangster if not he's just a, a wealthy business seed man so listen and see what you think our character is called ma'ar at this stage he started buying up properties in both the old city and the foreign concession and opened up shops he ended up with good connections in all sorts of unlikely places. Of course, Tianjin is full of smart crooks, and there are plenty of people who are ready and waiting to stab you in the back. If you aren't careful, 
It is really easy to annoy someone dangerous. They will get you for it. Make more. They will get you for it. Make no mistake about that. They will get you for it. Make no mistake about that, and you will lose everything. Ma'ar's father lost all his money that way, but that's another story. This is about Ma'ar. So, remember I mentioned before there's a lot of hustling, and there's, like Olivia Milburn said, this is a city living at the sharp end of a newly spreading um, Western colonial market capitalism madness. And it's it's not presented overtly critically in the book, but it permeates the whole thing. The hustle, you know, scrapping to survive by whatever means you can. Okay, remember I said at the start of the episode, I kind of teased you and made you think I was talking about Shanghai, but it was actually Tianjin. So both of those cities in the same era were divided up by the foreign powers. They were both port cities. They both had Western culture and Chinese culture, Western people, Chinese people side by side. I think they both had Japanese concessions as well. But here's a section, this is at the start of the Gobuli Baotsa chapter called He Just Ignores You, that goes into maybe the key divide between Tianjin people and Shanghai people. So here we go. Enjoy. Tianjin people like to talk about food, and they like to talk about entertainments, but they couldn't care less about clothes. If you want to talk about who's wearing what, then find someone from Shanghai. In Shanghai, they care about your appearance, but Tianjin people care about the finer things in life. Having enough to eat is the most important thing in life. As Tianjin people are wont to say, you wear clothes for other people to look at, but food, you eat for yourself. On the other hand, Shanghai people say that wearing silk, twill, gauze, brocade and satin is all to make yourself beautiful, but that eating fine foods is just showing off. A, Chien, a Tianjin person would reply, Have you ever seen a dog pass up a meat bun? Who is it impressing by eating that? The only one who enjoys the experience is the dog itself. The food and entertainments favoured by the inhabitants of Tianjin are not expensive at all. It is a matter of eating your fill and having as much fun as possible. Tianjin people like to eat three particular snack foods. 18th Street fried sesame twists, earlobe bread beans stuffed with rice cakes, and he just ignores you steamed buns. Those are the gobu li bao tzu. Um, so that bit at the end there with the translation of snack names, as I understand it, this can be a pretty tricky and, well, pretty tricky thing for translators, and it's tricky because there are a lot of, lots of ways to do it. And the debate about what is the best way to do it is, you could say, philosophical. There's not necessarily one ready-made answer. But um, going on off of what I said there about how this was maybe a big divide between, or an, an example of the big divide or differences between Tianjin and Shanghai, based on what Chinese friends have told me, and Western friends who've, and foreign friends who've seen a lot of China, the kind of down-to-earth approach of the Tianjin people versus the more socialite, social climber, pretentious attitude of Shanghai, I've been told that this is maybe, or it, it matches what I've been told about differences between northern, northern China and southern China, because Shanghai is relatively south, Tianjin's relatively north. But if you've got thoughts on that and you think I'm wrong or missing the point, do contact me uh, via social media that I'm going to list at the end of the episode, and we can talk about Baozi or whatever. So yeah, that's that little point. Okay, last thing. This is um, from the author's note that comes in the end matter, I think before the translator's note, but the, the two are side by side anyway. So this is Feng Jitai talking about illustration, because the illustrations in this book are by him. I don't know if I mentioned that before. All the illustrations in Faces in the Crowd are Feng Jitai illustrating his own characters and his own work. So a quote from him starts here. On the other hand, there are some authors who really care about the appearance of their books, the artistic qualities, such as the great Chinese novelist Lu Xun. Even though he did not know how to draw himself, he still designed the covers of many of the books that he wrote or edited. Even if you consider if you even if you only consider the binding, Lu Xun's, Lu Xun's designs are most tasteful and elegant an aesthetically pleasing quality to them. And this follows, sorry, quote ends there, this follows um, discussion about other uh, non-Chinese authors who illustrated their work. Uh, Hugo, Thackeray, Mayakovsky, Pushkin, Lermontov. So I think it's interesting here that as well as um, Western European writers, he's also citing Russian uh, writers. And it's a thing I've noticed I guess across this podcast is that the influence of Russian literature on Chinese literature is significant 
so the, the, the European influences aren't all Western European. A lot of it is Russian or further down the road, maybe Soviet, but certainly maybe more classic classic Russian from, from what I've gathered. It's interesting because I think that influence isn't necessarily there on a lot of the Anglosphere. Again, if you think I'm off the point there or getting something just drastically wrong, do write in, give feedback, help me correct my thoughts. And on that note, I think it is about time to do the plugs and end the episode, wrap it all up. So first things first, if you didn't already know, there is now a Facebook page and a Facebook discussion group for the show. Those have been growing a little bit, so I'd like to see if they can grow some more and if discussions not started by me happen in the discussion group. So if if you want to talk to other fans about the show, if you have a thought that you don't just want to really relay off of me, join the group, post it in there. Um, Outside of Facebook, I've been adding show episodes to YouTube and to Shimalaya. And YouTube, it's particularly fun because I've been making thumbnail previews. I don't know if you've seen how lots of YouTubers have like clickbaity thumbnails that they put on their videos to attract viewers. I've been making fun ones for the show. So if (laughs) if you want to see my uh, amazing, definitely amazing uh, Photoshop skills, head over to YouTube and listen to the show there. Shimalaya. Now, if you haven't heard of Shimalaya, that is the biggest Chinese podcasting platform. And I've been putting episodes up there parallel to the uploads to SoundCloud for the benefit (coughs) of people who want to listen to the show inside the PRC. Because you can listen to Shimalaya anywhere. Um, You don't have to be inside China to listen to it. But if you're inside China, you don't need a VPN. Whereas, because my audio files are hosted on SoundCloud, well, that's the main feed, PRC listeners need a VPN, which is a hassle. Even if they have it, the hassle is still a barrier to listening. So if you're in the PRC, or if you have friends who are and want to listen to the show, Shimalaya is, to be honest, your best option. Just uh, search for the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast, it should show up. If it's not working, uh, there are links to it on my Twitter, which, by the way, is at Angus Likes Words. That's a great place to get advanced info about the show, or to talk to me, or just to see what is on my mind. Mostly nonsense, but occasionally there's something interesting. Uh, if you are an Instagram user, the show has an Instagram platform. It is at Trishafic TR. Why am I brain firing this? Trichafic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. Um, yes, that is also a great place to get advanced info about the show and contact me and give feedback. If you want to support the show financially, help me cover hosting fees and what's not, um, there are two places. There's Buy Me A Coffee, where you can give a one-off contribution and fund my, well, not really coffee habit these days, but bus-taking habit. <laughs> Um, donut buying habit occasionally and there's Patreon where you can give a monthly contribution and access bonus content that I make for the show there are some bonus shows, some long, some short and there is now I've put up uh, the show notes that I use to record my IE episode as well, if those things interest you, they're all there on the Patreon, but don't forget the very best way to support the show in my opinion is by spreading word about it. If you have friends who might be interested in listening, tell them. Tell your family too if they might be interested. Tell your local Gobuli Balza vendor. Tell your boozing granny. Or if your granny doesn't booze, tell your normal granny, your non-boozing granny. Um, another thing I'll say, because I haven't said it for a while, is if, if you'd like to be on the show, if you'd like to uh, chat with me, about well chat with me whilst being recorded um, about any translated Chinese story that you like um, please 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 get in touch you're welcome on the show it is not supposed to be a big brain super serious super intellectual prestigious guests only show we've had cool guests but that is not because I only accept geniuses onto the show you don't all don't all have to be as expert as Chen Tio Fan Xia Jia or Nikki Harmon or Dylan Levi King to be on the show. I'm not particularly smart. You can be as dumb as me to be on the show. It's fine. I don't know if I can restate this enough without boring you all to death, but please, please do get in touch. And if you'd like to talk about, 
Chinese story you like and not be recorded for the show and have it be totally private. I like talking to listeners. I like talking to fans. So please, please do get in touch. That's all I've got to say. So until you tune in or download a stream or stream another episode, Zaijian. I'm not afraid.